All right. Thank you all for joining us for Grand Rounds today. I'm Chandra Cullen, the Vice Chair of the Child Psychiatry Division. I'm very pleased to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, um, who will be speaking on trauma and informed strength-based practices in pediatric integrated care, Dr. Destiny Wagner. Um, Destiny Wagner, PhD, is a licensed psychologist with the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center and UNM Hospitals. Dr. Wagner provides direct clinical services to children and adolescents and their families at Young Children's Health Center, a pediatric primary care clinic, and the Action Childhood Trauma Outpatient Clinic. She also delivers trainings and consultation on trauma-informed care to caregivers, providers, teachers, and other professionals in the community serving children and families. Dr. Wagner's research and clinical interests include working with diverse populations impacted by trauma and promoting trauma-informed, culturally responsive, and equitable systems of care to support the well-being of youth, families, providers, helpers, and communities. So thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. Hello, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. So today's focus um, will be on providing trauma-informed services, um, particularly at a clinic that I work at, Young Children's Health Center. Um, I don't have any financial uh, disclosures to make related to this presentation. Um, for the learning objectives today, um, I hope that you um, are able to uh, identify some evidence-based trauma-informed strategies uh, to implement system-wide, um, identify ways to foster team collaboration, um, and then learn a little bit about our outcome-based measurement system uh, for counseling at Young Children's Health Center. Young Children's Health Center is part of the UNMH system. Um, it was founded in 1981 um, and is located in the International District of Albuquerque, uh, serving the Southeast Heights community um, and beyond. Um, we, our patient population is a diverse community, both culturally and linguistically, um, including immigrant and refugee individuals and families. Um, about 42% um, of our population um, uh, has Spanish as their primary language. Um, about 4% of our population um, speaks Swahili, um, and about 7% um, speak some other language other than uh, Spanish, English, or Swahili. Um, and about 80 to 85% of our population identifies um, as Hispanic or Latino. And so just to give a little context for the importance of uh, providing trauma-informed care, um, uh, to recognize that New Mexico uh, ranks nas uh, last nationally for overall child well being outcomes, um, including 49th for economic well being um, and last for education. And about 30% of children in New Mexico live in poverty, uh, compared to about 18% of the national average. Um, and New Mexican youth age 6 to 17 experience higher rates of abuse and neglect uh, compared to um, the national average as well. Um, so um, given the population um, that we serve and um, the adverse experiences they face, uh, trauma-informed care um, is indicated um, to be delivered um, in the systems that uh, serve children. Um, so just a brief um, overview of the services we offer at our clinic. Um, we have, um, a, in addition to our medical services, of course, we also have home visitation services, uh, serving kids um, from uh, pregnancy to um, five years old. We have formal behavioral health services, including counseling and assessment um, and psychiatry services. We also offer community forums, um, the, where monthly we invite community members to come uh, learn about a topic uh, generally um, of their choosing. Um, most recently, we had a community forum um, on vaccines. Um, we offer parent groups. Um, currently, we have a parent group running uh, for Spanish-speaking mothers who um, are raising kids with developmental disabilities. Uh, we have youth groups. Um, we offer crisis intervention and brief intervention services. Um, we have a pretty robust case management services that help uh, navigate um, housing systems, um, food insecurity, um, and legal systems. 
So a trauma-informed approach, um, uh, SAMHSA has created a four principle trauma-informed approach. Um, and the first component is to realize and understand that trauma exists and how it might impact and also understand and recognize um, the healing possibilities. And then recognizing how trauma may manifest, how does it look when um, these children and families are brought into um, our clinics for care, and then respond utilizing uh, trauma-informed practices, and then take steps to resist, actively resist, re-traumatizing individuals. So trauma can stem from a variety of events. Um, trauma generally is an emotional physical reaction to an event that is witnessed and experienced as deeply troubling or disturbing. There's two types of um, categories of trauma in general, acute trauma, which is an abrupt and short-lived event, um, and then chronic trauma where an individual endures adverse conditions over time, such as exposure to community violence or domestic violence in the home, child maltreatment. And then chronic trauma at um, Young Children's Health Center and many of our clinics in New Mexico, chronic trauma is generally the one we um, tend to see more of and uh, need to treat more of. Um, and different types um, of trauma exist, uh, grief and loss, uh, medical interventions, uh, witnessing acts of violence, um, and cultural and inter intergenerational types of trauma. And some additional considerations to make, um, as well as to the impact um, of social determinants of health. Um, these are individuals, these factors impact an individual's health and well being and their quality of life. Um, so, some examples of that um, are safe housing, racism, discrimination, um, violence, lack of access to healthy nutrition, and these social determinants of health um, impact um, can have a great impact. Um, on top of that, um, considering toxic stress, including um, which exists as a prolonged activation of stress response systems and absence of protective relationships. Um, and these are considerations on, um, in addition to traumatic events um, that can be helpful to consider. And so with trauma-informed care, um, we may be familiar with the idea that instead of asking what's wrong with the child, we ask what has happened to this child. Um, and when we're serving um, communities of color and um, youth of color, we must also recognize and realize the historical and race-based trauma um, that is real and relevant. Um, and so when I say historical trauma, um, it is um, Maria Braveheart, um, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart uh, defined trauma as a collective group experience traumatic um, throughout time. So when we think of um, historical traumas, we think about uh, genocide, um, uh, boarding schools, uh, Japanese internment camps, um, the Holocaust. These are some examples um, of historical traumas. Um, so when we want to reframe and view um, um, use a trauma-informed approach and a trauma-informed lens, instead of um, asking what is wrong with this community, asking what has happened to this community and what is our part in their healing. So one way to consider um, how to approach looking at um, child um, uh, treatment for children who have experienced trauma as looking at adverse childhood experiences. Um, the studies done in the late 1990s uh, found that stressful and traumatic events in childhood um, are such as abuse, maltreatment, um, and other stressors are strongly associated with negative outcomes in adulthood, um, including increased risk for disease and poor social health. Um, and so a pyramid was created um, that I'll show you in a minute that um, looks at how to recognize um, uh, these ACEs, um, but it has recently been expanded on a few years ago uh, to also include systemic racism and discrimination and other historical sources of trauma to take that into account when we're viewing trauma-informed care. 
um, and also looking at the current social conditions, um, such as the social determinants of health, uh, to view behavior, to, to, be, to view youth and um, families' needs um, that uh, continue to traumatize or um, cause uh, adverse experiences and toxic stress for the families we work with. <clears throat> So here's the pyramid I was referring to. Um, so the one on the left is the traditional adverse experiences um, that was conceived in the late 1990s. Um, and then in 2015, it was expanded upon, um, as you can see on the bottom, to, um, to consider intergenerational trauma and historical trauma, social conditions, which could include um, poverty, uh, lack, of, um, lack of access to grocery stores, um, lack of access to um, quality education and healthcare. Um, and then it also um, looks, if you see the arrow on the right, um, that goes up and down, considering uh, microaggressions and implicit biases, race-based um, experiences, culturally-based um, experiences that can uh, create um, additional stress um, and impact a person's health, well-being, um, and yes. So utilizing the ACEs framework in uh, pediatric primary care. Um, and so one way to do this is um, to screen for ACEs uh, in primary care. Um, and in order to refer um, children identified as being at risk for behavioral problems or for health risks, based on ACEs questionnaires to refer them to prevention or intervention groups. Um, one such screener is called the Safe Environment for Every Kid or the SEEK. Um, this screener is used at Young Children's Health Center um, and it looks at um, identifying psychosocial problems and identifying family strengths at well child visits um, by their pediatricians. Um, and I'll go a little more into how this was um, applied in our clinic. So when we think about trauma or stress impacted youth and families, what they may bring to us in our clinic when they are seeking care is they may bring a sense of terror or fear, anxiety, depression, hypervigilance, isolation, self-doubt, uh, distrust of others, and distrust and dysregulation. And what we can help give them or provide for them when they come is a sense of connection, trust, predictability, a sense of belonging, safety, a sense of value and contribution, and helping develop a new self and other perception. So one way we've done this at our clinic is we use an evidence-based intervention uh, called attachment regulation and competency. Uh, this intervention um, was created to work uh, with youth and families uh, that have experienced chronic or complex trauma. Um, more recently, it has been used to um, in more delivery of care, including foster care systems and child welfare systems, uh, juvenile justice systems, school systems, um, and as well as pediatric, uh, pediatric clinics. Um, and so there's three core components um, of the ARC model, um, attachment, so the ability to connect and relate to others in a meaningful way, and that's developing a safe caregiving system. That's uh, what we can offer as a system, as a clinic. Um, we can offer a safe caregiving system and do the, this through attuning attunement, which is recognizing and realizing uh, what might be going on, becoming um, in tune with each other and consistent responding and creating um, positive adult contact. Um, the other components regulation is the ability to feel something and understand our own feelings um, and effectively cope with those feelings. And so teaching um, providers um, and staff members to be able to help them, themselves regulate in response to a dysregulated youth or caregiver. Um, and then the competency section um, is to um, help feel a sense of mastery of your environment, help children read developmental um, milestones and developmental activities, and help effectively engage in problem solving. Um, at my clinic, when we delivered this um, 
uh, this intervention, uh, we focused on the attachment and regulation components at the system wide level, um, and as as well as um, more specifically, um, when we are with a patient in a um, counseling or therapeutic relationship. Um, in addition to these three components, there's uh, 10 building blocks that are part of um, the ARC model that I won't go into today. One of the reasons that ARC um, can be a, a quite helpful um, intervention is because it is utilized as a flexible framework, meaning that there's not a particular protocol or order that things must be done. Um, and, and then it is more of a set of things to be used and apply and adapt given um, the context and given um, cultural factors um, and given resources as well. And it's been used in a range of settings, as I had mentioned, and has shown a reduction in post-traumatic stress symptoms and an improvement in general mental health, increased adaptive and social skills, and has stress in caregivers. Um, there's specific adaptations for different contexts, um, like I had mentioned, such as for foster care youth. Um, it, um, it has been shown to have positive effects with um, more cult culturally diverse um, populations, um, and it can be helpful uh, to use as since it is not so prescriptive, um, it can be adaptive um, and culturally responsive in that way. Um, so um, at Young Children's Health Center, um, they've been involved in um, an ARC learning collaborative two times. They partnered with the Action Childhood Trauma Clinic, um, and the ARC learning collaborative is um, a two, basically a two-day training and then about 10 consultation calls throughout about a year um, as you work to learn the intervention and apply it. Um, the most recent one was completed um, in 2019. Um, and then uh, recently um, I partnered um, with the Action Clinic and Dr. Quaylar, and we've created a six part training series um, where we did one all staff training. Um, and that involved everyone from um, the front desk staff to nurses, um, social workers, um, uh, pediatrician, medical providers, um, case managers, um, and um, the whole clinic. And then we did a five part uh, training that specifically uh, looked at family services um, for the family services team. Um, and so that uh, took about um, November 20. 20 to May 2021. And then as a psychologist at the clinic, I offer ongoing reflection and consultation sessions. So one of the things um, that we highlighted when we gave this training is, is the idea of tuning into yourself and to others. Um, because as as individuals in a system, if we're more active to tuning in to what's going on um, and to one another, we can be less reactive. Um, and that can help avoid uh, re-traumatization and help enhance quality of care. Um, and it helps build relational safety. Um, as you re um, remember that um, I talked about how the patients and families may come in with these mistrust of others um, and hesitancy to engage in care. So one way to do that is this um, and help recognize what is being communicated. Oftentimes trauma impacted youth communicate with behaviors rather than words. And so it's tuning in uh, to those things and getting curious about what they're bringing in. Um, so rather um, viewing someone like, oh, I know what that's about, instead getting curious and um, helping um, support the family and youth and sharing their own story um, in a safe way. Um, so relationships are central to healing and uh, relationships and attachment are um, a, a big factor of the ARC model. Um, overwhelming feelings can leave us feeling isolated and betrayed and create difficulty trusting in others and accepting support. So when we experience warm and dependable relationships, we establish trusting connections and this creates opportunities for corrective emotional experiences. So attuned relationships help us feel safe 
and calm us down when we are stressed. And so um, as we offer that, when people come to our clinic, if we can offer that warm and attuned relationship, um, we can help create positive interactions, which can um, help rewire the brain and restructure the brain uh, to be more trust trusting. So we talk about um, with our staff about managing the red ball of emotions. Um, we have um, emotions and our red ball can um, get a little unwieldy at times and go up over our head, especially when we might be um, dealing with challenging interactions. Um, sometimes our youth and our families come in quite dysregulated. Um, and so we really focus on first as individuals, as the, the helpers to help regulate and ground ourselves. So then we can support uh, the youth and family in co-regulation um, and help them um, regulate just enough that we can support um, the healing process. Another thing we've, we focus on in our clinic is creating rhythm. This is also part of the ARC model. So um, weaving in predictable routines into the clinic because um, the consistent practices offer felt coherence among members of the community and can provide a sense of belonging and establishing physical and psychological um, safety can be done through creating um, predictability um, and transparency. Okay, so that was the, how we're, we're applying the ARC model. I'm gonna shift a little now um, to a study um, and implementation process um, that we have been doing um, at um, Young Children's Health. Um, and so, um, Starting in 2014, um, the clinic uh, partnered with the um, Action Clinic, a Childhood Trauma at UNM, um, and Dr. Isaacson um, with uh, Community Behavioral Health. And they partnered to um, participate in Pediatric Integrative Care Collaborative, which was partnered with John Hopkins. Um, and so they started doing that and created, collected data, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and that ended in about um, 2018. 2018, just the end of 2018, um, but the, um, um, the system that was created is still ongoing. Um, currently, our clinic is participating again with a collaborative with John Hopkins um, that is a racial justice trauma-informed care collaborative, um, and I'll give you a little more information about that. <clears throat> So pediatric primary care is a vital entry point um, for trauma-exposed youth. Children and families are much more likely to see their PCP in a year than they are to see a mental health provider. So it is a, a great entry point to help um, screen um, and provide services. Um, and youth and families are often exposed that are exposed to trauma or have um, traumatic symptoms are often involved in multiple systems of care uh, from child welfare, child protective services, um, uh, special education services at school, physical health issues, mental health issues. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of lack of coordination between these systems. So that's one of the benefits of having a more um, uh, integrated model um, that has access uh, to different providers with different roles and knowledge. Um, so one of the reasons to screen, um, do a universal screening of trauma, it helps guide and inform care. It helps identify health needs and health problems that otherwise would be untreated or go, go unnoticed. Um, it can improve the likelihood of family acceptance of behavioral health referrals, uh, meaning if their pediatrician or their medical provider is um, talking with them um, about having a, a referral to behavioral health, uh, they're more likely to attend those appointments. Um, it can help reduce future instances of child maltreatment and trauma and help improve current functioning and needs of the family. So the screening tool that was decided to be used at Young Children's was the SEEK, which is the safe environment for every kid. So what they found over the course of time, um, they implemented the SEEK, um, they provided training on how um, to give the SEEK. It's about a 16 yes, no questionnaire. 
Um, so you can see in 2015, um, the total number of Sikhs completed by families was 113. Um, and then by 2018, um, the total number of Sikhs completed was 3,789. Um, so a lot of Sikhs questionnaires were being completed um, and it was partly due to increased training and increased tracking um, of how many screeners were completed. Um, the positive Sikhs, um, so in 2015, 110 were positive, that means they indicated some kind of um, impaired functioning, um, potential trauma, or potential behavioral health need, uh, which could be from food insecurity or to domestic violence. Um, and then in 2018, the positive Sikhs uh, was 1,443. So the more we screened, the more positive we Sikhs we were receiving. Um, so one of the challenges, right, is then what do we do uh, with all of this information and how do we support um, uh, these families that are uh, requesting and needing support? So we created, um, and before I talk, go there, I'll, I'll also mention that then after we screened for the seek, it was um, then now what do we do? Um, providers were indicating they weren't sure how to talk to the families about the seek. So when things came up, now how do I introduce this to the family and this conversation uh, to see um, what they need um, and what's going on? Um, so um, through this study, they created um, three surveillance questions. Um, did your family or child experience any major stressful events since we last met? How much are these events still bothering you? And then despite these concerns, what have been going good um, in the past few months for your child? Um, so a strength-based question uh, was included. Um, and this helped open the conversation about the potential uh, behavioral health needs. Um, and so the, the medical providers, um, pediatricians were the ones that asked these questions. Um, and then when these questions were asked um, and a need was determined, um, nurses would ask um, triage questions um, on a scale of one to 10, how concerned are you about this issue? And then on one, a scale of one to 10, how important is for you and your family to address this issue? Um, and then uh, the provider and nurse would indicate um, if it was an urgent need, an immediate need or a routine need. And then that helped the baby behavioral health team that was receiving the referral uh, to triage the needs. <clears throat> um, so the number of behavioral health referrals, um, as we screen, as we open the conversation in the well child visits, um, a greater need was identified, uh, or a greater number of families' needs were identified. Um, so in 2015, 682 behavioral health referrals were made. Um, and about of those made, about 60% of families would attend the appointment after the referral was made. Um, you can see in 2018, um, 1,187 uh, referrals were made um, and about 85% um, of families attended their first uh, behavioral health appointment. Uh, so we saw it through the training um, and um, fidelity checks, uh, we saw an increase uh, not only in the number of referrals made, but also in the number um, of treatment compliance of families attending those sessions. Um, we also had to create a network of um, outside referrals because um, um, as a clinic, we couldn't um, hold all of, if they need formal counseling or intervention, uh, we needed to refer out, out time, um, at times as well. <clears throat> so some of the barriers um, of doing um, a system like this is um, a lack of lack of training for medical providers on the methods of behavioral health and trauma-informed care. Um, some providers get that kind of training and some do not. Um, some um, providers voiced just feeling a lack of confidence on how to discuss these things with their patients since they had a lack of training um, and an absence of knowledge about trauma and traumatic stress. Um, and then of course, a lack of availability of resources and where to refer. Um, and I think everyone understands that in the system, um, there's long wait lists and it's hard to uh, find places to refer, refer kids and families to, to make sure their needs are met. 
Um, and then lack of time or institutional support can be a barrier. Um, and um, like I said, you can recognize the need, but then unsure how to talk about it. So um, this um, study and implementation process really tried to help support that. Okay. And I'll show you the um, resource um, if you want to read the article a little bit more. The article also, and during the study, we implemented three focus groups um, uh, with providers to get their feedback on the process. Um, some of the fidelity checks um, included um, um, the uh, providers would indicate, yes, I asked the surveillance questions, I yes or no, I made a referral, um, and we helped track some of the fidelity that way. So the next part is a continuation um, of um, the trauma-informed care collaborative we started um, in 2014 um, and we just started this one this year and um, it focuses on racial justice and racial healing um, and we have been focusing on uh, six components and so this is a learning collaborative we are um, <clears throat> we've been doing workshops and sessions um, via zoom um, with 10 other clinics um, and organizations across the country um, and we do it's a it's a common of self-assessments and creating um, certain goals. And so the power um, domain focuses on power sharing um, and, and making sure um, that um, a diverse um, population is being involved in the decision-making process um, and that um, uh, resources are being um, made available in order to engage um, in the, the racial justice work and racial justice healing. Um, Family-centered care um, are, um, just as it sounds, <laughs> um, and that's focusing on bringing families into the conversation, um, getting feedback from them about how they view care as being provided to them. Um, the people component is focused on um, is focused on um, building staff knowledge and competency around um, racial justice and racial healing concepts and, um, and the work and implementation process. Um, creating a culture um, that's not only culturally responsive, but actively taking steps and actions into um, promoting um, racial healing and racial, racially just healthcare and racially just um, practices. Um, programming, making sure we have um, available um, time and resources to develop programming and care, um, and then policies and practices. Um, these are things like including um, in our um, policies and vision statements and all of those things that um, there's a racial justice, uh, racial healing focus. Um, so, um, we used a PDSA format. Um, that's what we've been using for this, like we did for the prior study, uh, Plan, Do, Study, Act. Um, and so our initial um, a goal was to increase staff awareness um, to racial justice, racial healing, and anti-racism concepts, um, identify strengths and weaknesses or areas of growth uh, to provide racially just uh, services, uh, create an open space, a space for dialogue, and provide um, education trainings and workshop opportunities. Um, create more opportunities for staff to be involved. Uh, right now we have a core team working on it, which consists of uh, six of us. Um, two members are from outside the clinic. One member is a family advocate. Uh, so she um, is um, brings her family to the clinic and um, she acts as our family advocate. And then we've also partnered with a community member that's part of um, the diversity inclusion office at um, the city. Um, we also created a staff survey that we sent out um, and they completed and it asked questions um, about readiness and awareness, um, including um, 
uh, their comfort level of discussing race, race and racial justice topics um, and uh, inquiring about their knowledge about institutional racism and those kinds of concepts. Um, and our goal is just to bring more uh, voices um, to the table um, and more collaboration with community members, staff, and patients and family. Um, we've had about, we had a training this morning uh, regarding this. We've had uh, three others as well. We also have a monthly book club where we um, read articles and books about these topics and then how do we integrate these ideas into our clinic. Um, I posted this picture here. One of our uh, staff members that's not part of the core team um, took it upon herself um, to create this uh, bulletin board um, in, um, in our break room. Um, and it just is called Check Your Privilege and it's um, trying to enhance knowledge around and awareness around privilege. And um, she posted different definitions of different kinds of privilege. Um, such as educational privilege, able-bodied privilege, um, nationality privilege, and those things. And then we provided specific ex real world examples of how that privilege um, may, um, or lack of privilege may act out in the real world. Okay, so. All right, next, uh, last topic. <laughs> so the last topic is the outcome-based measurement system um, that we have um, for our counseling services. Um, and so we started um, this in uh, the beginning of 2020. Um, it uh, hit a little snafus around the um, administration due to the pandemic. Um, so uh, I would say we're still um, just uh, revving up with this. Um, um, so we um, had this um, plan to, to create um, a more evidence-based outcome measurement system at our clinic. We weren't using, uh, for the counseling services, we weren't using any formal forms. And so, we wanted to enhance clinical decision making and have some quality improvement checks. Um, and then our we do receive some grant funding and our funders had requested um, more um, evidence based um, uh, assessment. So the goal is um, assessment, tracking, and treatment would it help us achieve optimal treatment outcomes for the youth and families that we are working with. Um, and um, the main thing to just remember with outcome-based measurement that um, these checklists and measurements are not a substitute for clinical judgment, um, but they are just um, an addition to, to enhance accuracy and consistency of treatment. So the benefits um, of measurement-based care that researchers has found and um, that I have viewed anecdotally um, is it increases collaborative care. It helps bring the youth and family to become more informed and active in their treatment and increase shared decision-making. Um, and it helps communicate with the treatment team um, when I can um, have um, more um, concrete information to provide with the psychiatrist or the pediatrician. Um, it, it, it helps enhance communication, um, helps increase knowledge and understanding, um, and helps tune into emotional behavioral changes over time. Um, sometimes when families are living in the thick of behavioral or emotional challenges, it's hard for them to take a step back and view that progress may be occurring, just not in a way that they have ever viewed it. Um, and so it helps support the recognition of improvement, helps identify small changes and increase hopefulness, right? Even if it's a really small change, we can help point that out um, and that can increase that, that feeling and increase the likelihood of adhering to treatment, validate feelings and perceptions and help empower families to, to be able to understand and communicate um, their behavioral health treatment. So um, I'll go a little into what measures we use. We use what's called the BASC-3, third edition. Um, it's a behavioral and assessment screening for children. Um, it goes from preschool age children all the age to up to the age of 21. They have a parent and self-report. They also have a teacher report, which we don't use. 
Um, and then we also use the caregiver strain questionnaire, uh, which is a 21 item questionnaire uh, that parents fill out and they fill it out based on the stress they feel uh, when working uh, with, um, when they are dealing with a child that has an emotional behavioral issue. So within the first three sessions of counseling, we try to complete these measures. Um, and the BASC um, 3 is quite a long form. It takes about 25 to 30 minutes to complete. Um, and, but then this is shifted into a shorter form uh, to track change over time. Um, and so at each treatment plan update, which is about every three months, um, the family will fill out what's called the BAS3 Flex Monitor. And it takes less than five minutes to complete each time. Um, it usually takes about two to three minutes to complete. Um, and it tracks um, uh, symptom change um, over time. And then we provide feedback to the family um, and update their treatment plan. So here's an example. So um, the behavior assessment system for children, this is the longer form that you do at the initial baseline of treatment. It gives you a graph. It also gives you um, tons of other information that can be helpful. It gives diagnostic suggestions and things like that. Um, so it prints out this graph for you. You take a look at it um, and decide um, what might be helpful. On the left side, you'll see here, um, this is looking at the symptomatic, fun, uh, symptomatic symptoms such as depression, anxiety, um, hyperactivity, things like this. And then on the right side are the more adaptive and strength-based questions um, and looking at self-esteem and things like this. This, this particular form is the self-report. So the child responded to this form. Um, and then you take this and look at what I, I would like to um, Um, sorry, uh, the, and then you take um, this form and you say, okay, where might be my treatment targets? Um, so for this one, I might look at the anxiety and depression. I recognize it's in the at-risk um, place. Um, and then I look at the self-esteem and it's really low. So I'm like, okay, maybe I want to focus on anxiety, depression symptoms and target reducing those. Um, this is normed against um, the population. So it creates um, a T-score. Um, so 50 is the, the average or the middle. Um, and it, it basically takes um, kids um, of a certain age and looks at their um, symptoms and functioning. So if they're in the at-risk or clinically significant, it's saying that they are showing um, they're more symptomatic than maybe the typical, um, the typical kid, a typical similar age peer. So then it's turned into this fast flex monitor. Um, and so this um, looked at um, internalizing problems. So these forms are already pre-created. You don't have to create them. You can create your own form if you want, but these are the standard forms that are creative. They ha have one for um, uh, disruptive behavior, hyperactivity attention, um, and a variety of different forms. So this one looked at internalizing problems, which focused on uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and so this is measured over time. So you can see the bold vertical line, that's the intervention line. Um, the point to the left is the baseline. Um, and then every about every three months, um, this youth was given um, the, the flex monitor um, to watch progress. And so you can see um, the green um, area is known as the goal zone. So once they're in the goal zone, that means they're showing um, you know, emotional behavior, emotions and behaviors that are typical of that age group as measured um, by the VASC. And then um, we do the caregiver strength questionnaire, as I said, um, and it just over, uh, measures the overall level of caregiver stress. Um, so um, it measures um, if there's negative consequences for, for um, 
parenting a child um, with mental health issues? Are they missing work? Is it um, taking um, a toll on their personal life in any way? Are they feeling any negative feelings such as anger towards the child or are they relating poorly with the child? Um, and then we track this over time as well. So um, I, there was a lot of pre-planning um, in this and um, you know, one of the main things was to create buy-in for my team to want to, to do this. Um, and then some uh, in-depth initial training and then ongoing training. Um, and then a way to track the data and aggregate it as needed. Um, we are fortunate, to, we do have a data specialist at our clinic um, that tracks um, the seek data for medical side and all kinds of data. So uh, she helps me in tracking this data um, and then helping hold one another accountable. Um, and then recently we um, have now uh, decided to schedule monthly meetings uh, to troubleshoot um, how any barriers that are coming up um, for non-completion of the measures or if parents um, are having questions about it or difficulty completing it, um, and then add uh, provide ongoing consultation. And then finally, um, just additional opportunities to create collaboration within clinics. Um, at our clinic, we do have a monthly four hour all staff meeting uh, to do treatment planning um, and um, other collaboration activities. Uh, we have a weekly family services meeting. Uh, we recently did a mental health minute series, which was an hour long, twice a month um, series that one of our uh, medical providers created and um, I attended. And so it was basically um, looking at uh, behavioral health and medication. I acted as um, just a, a consultee that could provide input um, and help um, providers troubleshoot how uh, they're talking to kids about mental health and behavioral health. Um, opportunities to co-present. I um, actually had um, a wonderful pediatrician that was going to co-present with me today, but was unable to do so. Um, but having uh, opportunities to do that can be quite helpful. Um, and then when you identify patients with high needs, um, to just uh, have the increased frequency of check-ins with the treatment team. I have some patients that I meet about more regularly uh, due to the more complexity of the cases. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge a few uh, people and organizations. I wanted to acknowledge uh, UNAM Action Child Trauma Clinic, including Dr. Quaylar and Dr. Ezechukwu, who have been uh, very helpful in um, creating services and trauma-informed services um, and helping support uh, young children in doing so, as well as um, Community Behavioral Health and Dr. Isaacson. Um, and then my whole team at Young Children's Health Center, um, including um, John Buchan and, and Lisa Kionis, um, who are part of the leadership team there, and then of course the community that we serve and partner with. So, the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. That was a great talk. Um, yeah, if people want to put questions in the chat or just speak up, um, we, ha we have some time. So I, I want to comment. This has been amazing, um, Dr. Wagner. I. Um, I've been, I was involved early on with some of this, just getting things started with the, um, the partnership with Johns Hopkins and, and starting to uh, collect data. And I think it's a great example of how important it is to collect data what you can, even if you don't have a grant or a lot of funding for it, start collecting data um, and use it to inform care, but then that really takes off. And um, they've been, they, you guys have been using um, the data to, um, in grant proposals and um, justifying new staff. And so I just encourage, you know, people listening, whether whatever department you're in to, to really use data to, to drive care and 
um, if you collect it, the money will start coming in because you can justify the need for these kinds of services. So it's been really great to hear how things have taken off a young children's health center and also across new leadership as well. I think that's really important um, to, to comment on that um, as things change at clinics, young children's had this dedication from the beginning to really serve this and it, with this change in leadership that people carried it on. So thank you for that great presentation. I would love to jump in with a question and also thank you, Dr. Wagoner for representing um, years worth of teamwork and collaboration and, and such great work happening at YCHC. Um, my question is about the screening piece for ACEs and just, you know, I'm thoughtful about one of the potential risks or fears for universal screening for ACEs is that the floodgates will open in terms of the, the need um, being identified and maybe a lack of uh, community level resources and referrals to meet the need. And I wonder if you could comment a bit on how this has played out at YCHC and how you all have kind of accommodated for meeting that need or yeah. referrals. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a reasonable fear, right? because I think that systems, there aren't enough sys uh, availability to refer people to services. There's a lot, and we're under-resourced and um, less time. I think part of it is, okay, well, yeah, we could say what's well, probably exists, but let's not worry about it and move on um, because then what are we gonna do about it? So it, it is important to be quite thoughtful, right? Of Okay, if we're gonna screen, we do need to have a plan to then um, provide services and refer out. And what does that referral system look like? Our referral, uh, we call it our consult system. It's very robust. We have three people every week that look at it and run it. Um, that's part of their, their um, role. Um, they also, they're three social workers that do it and they manage it um, and share the load. So a lot of teamwork and team sharing. So I think thinking of the components of how do we screen? Once we screen, how do we talk about it? And then once we talk about it, what do we do about it? And having that planned out prior uh, to implementing something I think would be recommended. Um, but um, but there, there isn't necessarily enough, um, like managing expectations about being able to provide services I think would be important. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I would I would just also say to, to Raven's point, it's interesting now that we've started the racial justice collaborative. I feel like we're right in that middle of people really not sure about it and not wanting to talk about it. And if we talk about it, what will happen? So we're kind of in the middle of that. And I, I can feel people's trepidation about it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, thank you everyone, I appreciate it for coming and I hope uh, it was beneficial and please feel free to email me if you have any questions or follow up. Okay, thank you so much.